uh, welcome everybody who is here and if you're joining us for the first time um, welcome the next speaker uh, is Diana Polo uh, I'll just give you a background on her before she starts her talk Diana is passionate about research training and data science she obtained her master's in electronics from ESI double E She's currently getting her PhD while working as a part-time data scientist at Predictive uh, Insights. She's a full-time chief mom officer. And today she'll be giving us a talk on effective prompt engineering for Python programmers. Diana, over to you. So I'm a data scientist. Uh, I used to lecture, but for now I don't lecture anymore as I am focused on finishing my studies finally. And, uh, yeah, like everyone in the field, I started using ChatGPT and been learning a bit about it. So I, I thought, like, let me let me share what I've learned so far. So I'd like this um, presentation, like, I'd like you to gather as many questions as possible by the end. So or, or examples of how you use ChatGPT, so that you, I can have also your uh, your input by the end. Okay, so uh, we've all been hearing about this uh, large, large learning models that uh, ChatGPT and and Bard and Google AI and and, and Bing AI use. Uh, they are these models that gives you uh, a, a a way to discuss with basically a machine. So you get a lot of knowledge that is stored uh, somewhere. The models are trained on that knowledge. And you can then question the, the, the model through an interface and get answers to questions that you have. And instead of just being like Google, that just returns to you like a bunch of answers, these, these methods allow, allow you to have a kind of a conversation with, with the machine so that you are dynamically engaged and interacting. So you send a text input, the model uses statistics, and tries to figure out what you're saying. And based on that, it so creates an answer that can be another text output, or it can be text represented in numeric values in case that it has to be used by another system. So uh, large learning models, they are built on deep learning networks. So I'm just giving a quick introduction so that because everyone is talking about it and it's like buzzwords, but in general, what does it do? It's it's built on deep uh, neural networks, so it's deep learning, and it has it has a layers, a bunch of layers of of uh, nodes that use what is called attention mechanisms. Uh, the attention mechanism allows the model to only focus and give weight to certain weights in the sentence that you send through. And it gives different weights to the words and then tries to capture the relationship between those words and give it a context so that it gives you the right answer based on the context that it has discovered. And they are trained on a large, large set of data. And uh, they have a, a huge, huge data that goes from conversations on the Internet and stuff like that. So from that, they learn grammars. Uh, different facts and different uh, reasonings that can be true or false, but it, it's learned anyway. So because the answer is so sometimes a bit vague because it's learned on such a big, big set of data, let's say you want to ask questions about uh, something medical and the words that you're using in medicine, they also exist in normal language. So you kind of have to uh, structure your question so that it makes it easier for the model to understand the context that you're talking about. And the, to do that, you use effective prompt engineering. Prompts are those questions that you ask the model to get an answer. They give the, on, the, the, the model a blueprint in terms of giving you the right input. And when you do prompt engineering, you make sure that you craft your instructions so that they guide the model to give you the most, the best response. So it shapes the output by, by giving some context to the model and giving some constraints as well to the model. 
And why is effective prompt engineering good? It's because it improves the model outputs. If you give enough information and you give the right information and you give the good guidance to the model, then you're more likely to get responses that are relevant to you rather than just re responses that could be just vague. And it reduces bias uh, because, as I told you, the models are created based on existing data. So if anyone or any group of people added some type of bias, the model might have learned it because it doesn't really discriminate as it gets the data. It just learns from it. So it, that bias can give you not only just offensive responses, but it can just give you wrong responses because that's what a group of people said in a forum, uh, that the, the earth is flat. A bunch of people say that the model might tell you that it's true. So effective prompt engineering helps you get answers that are less on the biased side so that you can guide it towards that. I don't want answers that are this way. I'd rather like answers that are uh, that go with the fact that the earth is not flat, for example. And it also allows you to have a personalized learning example. This is if you are learning about, let's say, a Python topic. Instead of just learning what everyone is learning, you're struggling with something specific, you can go and talk about the specific problems you have and get answers that can actually help you with your learning needs. And it also helps with critical thinking development for me because, as I said, the models don't really always give you a correct answer. So you need to think for yourself. When you see this answer, does it make sense? Or it can give you a basis that you can then use to go and look for actual publications, actual work that people have done, and find out if it actually fits with the, the, the responses that the model has given you. And it also allows for a, a bit of creative expression. When you are, let's say, I had to start doing this slideshow and I might not be the most, uh, the most, uh, what do you see? It's the person that talks in public the best. I can go to ChatGPT and ask, can you help me design the slideshow? Can you, it even can help you. Like, can you help me decide which pictures I must put for this slide? And it kind of gives you ideas like that. So it's really good when uh, for some certain people like me who are not that creative to get a good a starting point, at least in your creative journey. Um, I just want to check if everyone can hear me well. Yes, we can hear you. Fine. Yes, we can hear you. All right, thank you. So now we've kind of had an introduction into prompt engineering. Uh, I'm going to look at some type of prompts. There are many classifications. So this is not the only one you're going to find out there. Uh, we're going to look at instruction prompts, contextual prompts, completion prompts, and a few question answer prompts. So. The first type we look at is descriptive prompts. They are type of instruction, uh, instruction prompt. That you give ChatGPT an example, but uh, a, a prompt, sorry, but it asks it to generate a detailed explanation. So let's say you are getting started with a concept and you'd like to know more about it, then you can ask a question like this example here, getting started with for loops or while loops and you want to know, uh, have a detailed explanation of the concept of loops in programming and how they are used. So you would use this type of descriptive prompt. It's always nice when you are, it's also nice when you are teaching a certain concept that you probably use and you don't know how to express it. You don't know how to explain it properly. So you can ask ChatGPT to try and explain the concept for you in words that maybe you didn't have. And then we're going to look at query prompt. Those questions are designed to get a direct answer or direct uh, piece of information. So for example, if you want to retrieve a fact, is the earth flat, for example, that's a, a query prompt. Uh, so you want this quick information retrieval. So if you want to have statistics about 
uh, let's say your data, you, you give examples of input data and you want to get some quick statistics about the data using Python, it can try and run that for you. It may give you wrong answers. So you'll have to check if it's actually true, but at least it can give you, uh, let's say, the code to get started on getting those statistics. And uh, it can also help you with a lot of problem solving so that you, if you have a problem, you try and ask queries that allow you to solve that specific problem. And this is the, the example, one example of a query prompt. So I have a code and I want to know the output, what the output is going to be. So by running this, it should give me the right answer or not. As I always say, it might give you the very, a very bad answer, but it's for you to now critique the answer that it's going to give you. But this is like an example. Uh, and how do you use this prompt as a programmer? It's very good for debug, uh, debugging. You're getting an error that says this, this. You've never seen this error before. Then you can put the error there. You can also put the code that generated the error. And it can give you, uh, if it knows, it can give you an idea at least of what could cause this error. And the, you can use it to learn some syntax and its usage. You can use it to generate code. So you want to have code that does X, Y, Z. Say, I want to create a code that does this, this, and it can generate the code for you to then test if it works. And it can help you optimize your code. Um, I'm going to talk about R now. But when you come from Python and you go to R, you have sometimes a tendency to use for loops when for loops in, in R are very uh, resource consuming. So they are not the most efficient way to do things. And there's other ways to serialize uh, data and use what we call like L apply. So if you have a for loop, that's what you came up with when you're coding in R in, in a certain instance. You can then put that for loop in, um, in uh, chat GPT and ask to optimize it for you so that it uses L apply instead of, of using the loops. And uh, here's another, just a, another example of how you could use a query prompt is when you have some code that uh, the previous developer left and there's no comment and you don't know what, what it's doing or your own code that you wrote yesterday, and then when you wake up, woke up today, you have no idea what it's, what it's doing. You can actually put your code in chat GPT, and um, it, you ask it to comment a code for you, and see if it actually makes sense, if the code, the, the comment that it, it gives you actually makes sense. In this specific example that I asked, it, it understood the code, even though I didn't say kilometers, for example, it understood that this is asking for kilometers. So prompt the user to enter the distance in kilometers that the comments are cut, but then you get an idea. And uh, define the conversion factor from kilometers to miles and calculate the, the distance in miles and then display the result. So this is one of the one of the things I do the most with ChatGPT at work, when it comes to work, I, I am not one who likes documenting. So now it has become a bit easier for me because I can just code, 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 and then ask ChatGPT to do the comment part for me. And then I just recheck if uh, the, those comments make sense. And uh, the next type of prompts that we're looking at are contextual prompts where you give ChatGPT a context. It doesn't just generate a response out of nowhere. You direct it according to a certain context so that you have more relevant uh, responses. So this can uh, be used to simulate, uh, to stimulate creativity, generate imaginative narrative, and simulate conversation within a setting. So you can see it can, use, it can be used outside of programming as well as, as within programming. So outside of programming, I tend to do uh, this contextual prompts to generate stories. So this is just a side note, because like they told you in the beginning, I'm a chief officer. 
So um, since I'm not good at, at bedtime stories, now I, I give a context and a, a few ideas, and then ChatGPT generates bedtime stories for me. Or my kids give me ideas, the very wild stories, and I put in here, and then it gives me a story, and then I can just fix here and there. And yeah. Um, so here's an example now back to programming. Uh, I want to, to create, I want to write a paper. Okay, so I want to write a paper on. Uh, something I'm writing about LLMs. So I give uh, ChatGPT the context. You're a researcher, you're writing an article on the impact of LLMs in NLP, and then I give it a bit more guidance. I need a paragraph on the challenges, I need uh, some a paragraph on the benefits, and I needed to talk about ethical uh, considerations as well. But if you do this, then it's going to give you a nice little narrative, a starting point for your article. Uh, you can ask it for a full structure. It gives you a nice structure to start with. Beware, do not use it as is when you submit your article to the conference, because there are tools out there that can pinpoint if your, your, your text, your article was written using uh, AI tools. And they might just uh, reject it or your professor will give you a zero. So don't go tell them that I told you that. You must copy verbatim from, from uh, ChatGPT. Okay, so the next type of prompt you're looking at are completion prompts, where you give a partial sentence and you ask ChatGPT to complete it. It's, uh, it can help when you are like, you have some information and you need ChatGPT to give you, give you the rest, but it can also help a lot in case of just trying to be more creative with something, not wanting to say something the way you would have said it, trying to see another point of view, then you can add it to yours. So here, for example, I say the three main advantages of using Python for data science are, and then it can then just start continuing from here. I don't want to give it too much. I just want to know what's out there. So I just start and I let the, the model complete for me based on what it knows. So we've looked at a few prompts. Now, next thing I want to look at is model tuning. Uh, fine tuning is the, the process of further training a pre-trained LLM. So like I told you before, the LLMs are trained using data that is generally on, available on the internet and stuff like that. And now you want to Further train it, but based on your specific task or what you want to do, so that you uh, tailor capabilities as well as the outputs so that it fits your actual purpose. So it's very important uh, because you are not doing some gen when you are not doing some general work and you want to focus, then you need to at least give it a bit of information so that. Uh, it gives you more more relevant answers. So an example is you want to use an LLM for a medical chatbot. So you want the to use ChatGPT because it has an API. You want to use ChatGPT API to 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 work together with your your medical chatbot. You need to fine tune it and give it some of the information that actually is going to be discussed in your in your in your chatbot. Is it going to be a medical chatbot about what? Is it going to be about tuberculosis, for example, then you're going to give it some information about tuberculosis and, and so on and so forth. So here, what we've been looking at so far, most of them were zero shot uh, prompting. They're just like simple prompts where you just provide the description of the task and then you let ChatGPT give you an answer. And then you get one shot prompting where on Instead of just giving the task, you give it one example. So you can see here, I'm asking uh, for a code, uses a regular expression, to extract the store code from the following. So I've given it an example, so it doesn't just say, instead of just saying, give me a code that extracts store codes, a regex code that extra extracts uh, store codes, from what? Now I'm giving it an example, then it knows that this is it, and then it will give me the code that allows me 
to extract this regular expression. And um, that was one shot code. And then we have few shot uh, uh, prompts where instead of just giving one example, I give multiple examples. So instead of just this one example, I'm going to give a few. And giving those few, I would like to then have a code that extracts the store code from all of them. It's generally even helpful if, let's say, the store code doesn't have followed this format altogether, always, if there's a different format, or if sometimes it happens at the end or something, if you give it a few examples of how it's actually, the data is actually going to look like, and it can learn better and give you a code that is more likely to take care of all these examples rather than uh, just one. And uh, so I wanted to say, like, when you get started, let's say you're opening a new, a new chat on ChatGPT or on, on Bing AI, you have to get start, started right. So it's advised to start with a contextual prompt. So you set up the context. For example, you say, act as a Python software engineer. And then you tell it the task that it has to, to, um, to perform for this chat, the, the, the duration of this chat. So your first prompt is going to uh, include that context, the task that you're going to do. So we're going to develop a crude application to manage a library. Okay, then we give it a context. It's going to be a web-based uh, Python application and then we give instructions. So the first prompt has to contain all these. I want you to generate the code for this application, starting with the create part. And if you have some type of data, you have an idea of what the data looks like that is you're going to start with, like, for example, uh, at least like what the, the SQL database is going to look like, a few examples of the rows in there, you can give that as, as some input data so that it actually you code that's more adapted to that specific data and you can do a few few shot learning using this input data uh, here's an example that uh, of a of a starting prompt where i say from now on i would like you to ask me questions so that i create a, a relational database so i want to start a project because I have, there's a soccer team in my area, and I want, we want to start uh, gathering data, but which data do we start with? So instead of thinking it on myself, I'm just like, okay, I'm gonna make ChatGPT ask me questions now so that I can feed it all the information it needs, the type of data it needs, and then it will, at the end, when it gets all the, the information it needs, it can then give me what it thinks is the best structure for this uh, the database. So this is going to be, it's going to take a, a few back and forth prompts, but this is the starting one where I give it a, a bunch of information and then I'm going to go back and forth with ChatGPT so that we can together uh, work on, on, on creating the structure of that relational database. And now we're going to look at some challenges of using ChatGPT. The first one is the lack of control over the model's responses. It can have very unpredictable outputs that can not only be uh, sometimes unreliable, but it's just false, right? Out false. And it is difficult to make sure that you always avoid the undesirable uh, outputs. So you can have unintended consequences in certain contexts. And it can be a problem if you are living, you're using it in a live application. So let's say you're using the ChatGPT API as the, the basis of your chatbot, and you might not be able to control the answer that your, um, your, your users are going to actually get. So to, to help limit that, you have to use a human-in-the-loop approach where you incorporate uh, reviews, human reviews and validations of, of model outputs before delivering answers to the, the end users. This is not really feasible with chatbot, but you can at least decide that uh, we, ha we have 
a certain point where we review at least a few of the answers so that we see if the model is still doing right, or we can have at least feedback from the users where we ask if the answers were okay, and then the answers that are flagged as not okay, we can then uh, look at them later. Uh, we can implement some conditional generation to guide the model's responses, and then there's a specific keyword, then we make sure that uh, it goes to a certain a certain way, or if the 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 response has a certain keyword, then maybe we try to to remove that. We must make sure to leverage response ranking. I haven't tried the other like uh, Bing AI if they have uh, ranking, but I know that ChatGPT has ranking, where they ask you about uh, the output to to rate the output that you were given. So. For your model, if you keep uh, ranking at least your specific uh, model that you're doing uh, using for for uh, for your application, we'll know that this is more like the type of of responses that this specific user is okay with, and those ones are not appropriate. So that you reduce the chances of displaying undesirable responses. And then there's also ethical considerations. So we know that the data is trained on a lot of internet data, as I said before, that can be biased, can be false, can be uh, harmful. So you must be uh, vigilant if you're using it inside your code to minimize the bias. And you must, just like I said before, try to monitor the output always to ensure fair and respectful uh, language generation. And you must make sure that you safeguard the user data. Let's say you are sending a few input data for your uh, few shot learning. You must make sure that you anonymize that data, for example, that you don't send people's names and, and bank card numbers, or I don't know what other information you have about your users. And you must regulate, uh, you must regularly evaluate and mitigate any biases in the responses, again, by just checking what the responses are. And you must always keep in mind yourself that ChatGPT is limited and can make a lot of mistakes. So you also use it responsibly. And if you have an app that uses ChatGPT, just make sure that the users are informed that it's using ChatGPT and be open with them so that they understand the capabilities as well as the limitations so that they come they, they don't come and blame you for classifying their image as a monkey and you must just and they must just kind of understand that ai is limited it's not uh, it's not magic so in conclusion they always say there's no stupid questions but i don't know are there maybe they are maybe they aren't but in terms of chat gpt you might get a stupid answer if you don't ask your question right. And uh, here I've put a few nice resources. If you want to know more about the attention mechanisms, it's here. If you want um, uh, to know more about prompt engineering, there's a nice article here. And this one here is a nice article if you're using ChatGPT API uh, to build a, a chatbot and actually train it with your own data. So this is a very uh, interesting, uh, it's a very interesting tutorial that you get here. And that's it from me. Thank you so much, Diana. Thank you so much, much nice for Diana. For Diana. Are there any questions Are there for Diana? Any questions? I don't know. What I want to ask is, how do you deal with the issue of hallucinations? Like, especially when programming, where ChatGPT just uses methods or libraries that don't exist. I always say testing, testing, testing. Use your, use your knowledge. That's why I always say I do not go uh, ask ChatGPT questions about a language that I do not master personally. So if I have those 
VBA Excel, I will not even try to use ChatGPT because I will not even begin to know where the, the, the lying is and where the, the not lying is. So just make sure that you have a basic good understanding of the, the programming questions you're asking. Test the response. And yeah, you have to do those two things. Are there any other questions? Are there any other questions? No other questions from the crowd. And I think online, let me just check if there's any question online. There is no question online. Thank you, Diana, for this insightful talk. Um, I, I think everybody received it quite well. So another round of applause. Thank you.